All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so actually, just for a little context, I'm interested if anyone went to FOSTEM. Would you mind putting your hand up if you went to FOSTEM? One person. OK, great. So uh, yeah, this talk is pretty similar to what I did at FOSTEM, so I just didn't want to kind of bore you with the same thing. But uh, that's great. If no one's been, then we can just go through a similar kind of talk. Um, right, so my name is... <laughs> my name is Jonathan Bull. Um, this little bear is the avatar I use everywhere, so you might have seen it if you've looked at any of our projects already. Um, John Bull on GitHub, Baron Bull on Twitter, and of course I work for CoreOS. Um, so today I'm here to talk about two things. The first is AppC and the second is Rocket. Um, I want to, to keep things interesting, I thought maybe we'd do it a little bit interactive, so you know, if you have any questions or anything you want to kind of delve into at any time, then just shout out and we can kind of go on a little digression. Um, <laughs> Terrible at this. Okay. <laughs> what will be your cue for switching slides? Uh, I'll just oh, thumbs up. Thumbs up at you. Okay. All right. Great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the app. First, we're going to talk about the app container, which is uh, sort of a project and an organization. They're on GitHub, um, and that's the mailing list to discuss things app container related. All right. So what is the app container spec? Well, it's a new sort of open specification that we're proposing and sort of developing in the open. Um, for running applications in containers. And so I'll go into a little more about um, sort of what's guided us as to like, why we've developed this new spec, what's very important to us. So the first thing is that it's open. Uh, so it's not, although we announced it originally, like CoreOS announced it and sort of worked on the first iteration, um, we really want this to be a community-driven specification. So it's an independent GitHub organization. It's not under the CoreOS GitHub organization. Um, and it was developed with a lot of really valuable input from these companies like Cloud Foundry, uh, Mesosphere, Google, Red Hat. And then since we've released it, a ton of people in the community have, been, have provided a lot of really valuable feedback and, and sort of contributions to, to shape the spec. Um, and we'd love to have everyone involved who's interested. The second main principle, getting to, to sort of the technical side of it a bit more, is that, well, I guess not quite so technical to start with, but is that it's very simple. So it's simple to understand, um, and it's simple to, to implement. Um, but the flip side of that is that while it's simple, you know, while it's simple to understand and implement with sort of very basic tools, um, that it provides a lot of uh, 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 ways in which we can optimize and so that we can, we can run uh, containers very efficiently, very fast. And so, for example, you'll see that... that uh, some things like uh, content-based addressing, which we, we sort of feature quite heavily in the spec, um, you know, are there so to facilitate uh, like aggressive caching of, of downloads and things like that. Um, the second principle that's very important to us is security. Um, so there's a couple of, of, of sort of three main components to that in the spec. The first of which is that uh, we address uh, containers or application containers um, first and foremost by a cryptographic hash of the image so that Given a container, you can always sort of validate that, that it's what you expect and that you know, if you have a container on disk and then you transfer it across the network, you can check on the other side that everything's the same um, and that it's a way to sort of globally identify a given image and know that it's sort of bit for bit identical. Obviously, that's, that's dependent on the strength of the cryptographic hash, but um, so far, we, right now, we're using Sharp 512 and we're pretty confident that that will be uh, you know, doable for the foreseeable future, but we'll also leave it open, the option to use alternative hashes in future. The second component of that is image signing and encryption. We want these to be like the default ba behavior, basically. We want everyone to be thinking about these things and using them in their implementations. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about what that uh, consists of later. And then the third thing is this idea of container identity. So uh, for those of you who've, um, excuse me, uh, the idea there is that we want uh, uh, every application container that's running to have its own identity and to be able to communicate with other applications um, and to be able to verify the identity of, of sort of what other application they're talking to. Um, this is a concept that companies like Google use sort of extensively internally. So every communication between applications at Google has this idea of sort of being able to uh, authenticate who you're talking to. Um, and we want to bring that into the, the container world because we feel that's sort of been missing from a lot of the talk about um, how we write applications in, a, in, in containers, how we run them and how they can communicate. The third uh, thing, which I sort of alluded to in, the, in, the, in terms of simplicity, is that um, we really want the specification to be based around you know, well-known tools, um, things like tar, gzip, gpg, that have been around for years. You know, they're, they're, quite, they're very well-defined. Um, 
They're very, they're very ubiquitous, so lots of different platforms support these tools and standards. And really, the goal of the spec should just be a, a, a way to glue these different standards together in a way that everyone can agree on, um, so that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel in all these areas. Um, but again, like the, the counterpoint to that is that the spec should be, it, it should be uh, extensible so that we can take advantage of more modern developments. So like BitTorrent, for example, so for, in terms of distrib distributing images, or like XZ, which is a much more modern compression algorithm than GZIP, so you'll see better performance there. Um, the third principle is that we want uh, implementations of the spec to be highly composable. Um, so one of the things we mean there is that we want uh, application images to be able to integrate really well with existing systems, so existing init systems and process managers, for example. I'll talk more about that when we get to Rocket. Um, and the other important piece there is that it's an agnostic spec, so that uh, different operating systems and architectures can implement the spec, and they can all, you know, if we all agree on the spec, then we can uh, have these things that are very interoperable. Uh, okay, that's great. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, I'll talk a bit about the different components of the spec. So what are we actually like, what are we actually defining and trying to sort of agree on? So the first part um, and sort of the, the, the uh, you might think of it as sort of the core of the spec and the, the thing that most people will think about when we talk about, oh, sorry, go ahead. We have a question? Yeah, I was going to say stand this way because you keep blocking. That's what I was saying. Okay. How's that? Um, the image format is, is what many people will think about when we talk about sort of a container or a container specification. Um, so that's actually containing, you know, all, containing your application. Um, in the app C spec, what we mean by that is it's, it's a simple tarball that contains your application and all of its dependencies, all the files it needs to run. So it might be some certain libraries or configuration files or things like that. Um, and then it contains a, an image manifest, which describes the application, describes the contents of the file system, um, some different annotations, things like that. And then coming back to the, the, the idea of this cryptographic hash that I mentioned earlier, it's fundamental to AppC that every image is uniquely identified, globally uniquely identified, by its hash. So that hash is literally just the checksum, like I mentioned, the SHA-512 sum, of the, uh, of the image, of the table. And then, I'm sorry, and then we, also in the spec, we talk about um, things like encryption and signing, which are then layered on top of this image. So, for example, it would be an optional extension to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, compress an image you know, using GZIP or XE. Oops, wrong one. All right. So the second major area of the spec, um, and one that we're really excited about, is what we call image discovery. And the idea there is that we want to provide sort of a federated uh, namespace of being able to go from a name of an application, a name of an image, to actually being able to retrieve that artifact. Um, we don't want there to just be like a central repository which, where everyone has to store their images and get them from. We want to uh, take advantage of, uh, we ch chose to, to take advantage of DNS um, to implement this discovery mechanism so that people who have, you know, for example, uh, people who have control of their own DNS uh, domains and all the subdomains, they can leverage that to take control of their own images, for example. But at the same time, it's the convenience of being able to make that available to other users. Um, so for example, uh, so since all since in, as part of the spec, application names have to conform to this certain format, which means they must contain uh, only the valid DNS characters, um, we encourage applications, it's not mandatory, but we encourage applications to take a name of this sort of form, where, which looks like a, you know, a DNS, like a, a, a URL. And in the event that applications do use, uh, images are named like this, then we, pr we talk about this image discovery process, which is a way to go from this to a URL to actually retrieve that application. Um, and I'll go into more detail about that again when we talk about Rocket. The next component of the specification is the execution component. So that's talking about actually running the application. So once we have this image, you know, we've, we've discovered it, we've fetched it to disk, now what does it mean to actually run the application? And so there we talk about, we're looking at defining things like uh, the runtime environment. So the uh, environment variables that the application that's running in this container that's conforming to the spec can expect to see. Um, different isolators, so that's actually the, like the container or containment part of the container in terms of like memory limits, uh, network limits, those kinds of things. Um, and the other big component uh, to the executor is that we're defining with the executor is networking. Now, networking is a very hairy topic. Um, 
everyone has a different idea of, of what networking should should look like. Um, many, many existing variants have like uh, vastly different uh, network layouts. And so in the spec, we've taken a, trying to take a very, the balance of a very sort of useful and flexible, but very uh, simple approach. Um, so one of the, the things here is that the only thing we define about networking in the spec itself is that every container, excuse me, every container must be uh, allocated a layer three, so an IP address. And the idea there is that it sort of ties back into that idea of identity, so that over the network, the, I, the, um, the component that, the unit that is identified is the container. So you can talk to a container over the network on an IP address. So of course, the other implication there is that um, since every container has an IP address, then every container can manage its own ports. The final component of the spec, which is sort of a subcomponent of the executor, is this idea of a metadata server. Um, what a metadata server is, is, is a, a web-based server that provides sort of metadata to applications running in the container. Um, if any of you have used sort of a, something like AWS, you might be familiar with this. Um, the idea is that there's a simple HTTP service uh, provided on a well-known endpoint. So in the case of AWS, I think it's you know, the IP, special IP like 169, 254, 269, or something like that. In the case of the spec, we're, we're, we're um, saying that it's going to be passed in by this environment variable. And when applications reach out to this URL, they, they get back metadata that describes the container that they're running in. Um, so we prescribe a, a set of well-known metadata that they need to that this endpoint needs to provide, but you can imagine implementations also annotate, annotating it with other metadata. So an application can discover, like, I don't know, what, what, what data center it's running in, or maybe even what host it's running on, or things like that. The other really important part of the metadata server that we're defining um, is this uh, verification endpoint. So again, that goes back to the identity I talked about earlier. The idea is that an application can post some data to this endpoint, and it will retrieve back an HMAC signature, generated by the metadata server. Then when it's talking to another application and sending, that data, sending the original data payload to the other application, it can send that uh, signature along with the, uh, with the data. And the, new, the application on the receiving end can speak to its own metadata server and verify that signature. So then it knows, it can verify, as long as it trusts the metadata server, it can verify the authenticity of, of where it's received that uh, data from. So those are the four sort of, yes? Uh, on the um, most minimal possible implementation of the SP uh, specification, mm -hmm. is it mandatory to have something like uh, this metadata uh, server uh, up and running? So the question was, on the most minimal implementation of the AppC specification, is it mandatory to have a metadata server running? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and I suspect uh, we'll see different sort of implementation. This, this is where the idea of the, uh, the spec becomes a little less, um, you'll see sort of different sections of the spec being implemented by different components. So if you were to provide a runtime for application container images, um, then absolutely we would require that. So for example, if a, if a platform hosting provider was providing a runtime for application container images, we would absolutely expect them to need to uh, supply a metadata server. But if you're, you know, you're a company that's running the AppC spec inside your environment, maybe you just want to implement the container image format and be able to leverage that and sort of produce images that you might even share with others and just have a standard within your organization, but you might have an existing service you know, equivalent to the metadata server and not necessarily implement it. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes? So my question there is, would you then, as somebody who is just building an image as an image provider, you know, would you then expect to be able to get values that were defined in the spec from all, or should you know you be able to fail back to uh, requesting a metadata or information from metadata service, or even from the container executor, but like be okay with not receiving the answer back? Okay, so the question was: as a producer of application container of images, uh, should you be able to expect that that metadata server will always be available, or should you design it such to fall back? Um, and I think obviously you know, the latter approach would be much more robust. Um, but it's reasonable to suppose that some images that are targeted for certain environments might always have that requirement, and then they would simply fail in such an environment. But, uh, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the tooling that exists around the spec today. Um, 
So this is stuff that, that we've already built and are kind of using. Um, the first is a simple command line tool called AC tool, tool build. Um, and all that does is takes a root file system that you can assemble sort of in, in one of many ways. Um, if you have a static binary, that might just be a simple binary on disk. It takes a manifest, which is the manifest I talked about earlier, which describes an app, sort of describes the application image, and then it converts that into an ACI, uh, which is the application container image. So that's the table that I talked about earlier. Um, go ahead. The second key part of this uh, AC tool is a validate subcommand, and so that's what we use to to allow you know a tool that we use to 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 make sure that ACIs are compliant with the spec. So the idea is that here's this is a tool that anyone can who's implementing the spec can use against their own images that they're producing to make sure that, yes, this is actually a valid specification. The next tool is Discover, and that's a simple implementation of the Discover protocol I talked about earlier. Um, so it allows, mostly for testing, so it allows you to just provide it an application name and it will uh, show you sort of the resolved uh, endpoint to retrieve that binary. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the community. Um, as I mentioned, sort of we announced this APSI spec together with Rocket um, back in December, um, but since then we, we sort of split the two to make APSI its own organization. Um, and we've seen some really, a really great community emerge, a lot of people having a lot of input, um, and a few different projects have, have emerged uh, around the spec, completely separate of, of sort of the stuff that we've worked on or of Rocket. So the first thing is, is a C++ library that, uh, for working with app containers, um, libapsy. Which is, uh, and so that allows you to sort of uh, generate, um, generate and, man and validate sort of the manifests that are part of the specification or generate application images from, uh, or, and do these kinds of things using you know, native C++ libraries. Um, and as a side note to that, if any of you are sort of Mesos fans or big Mesos users, um, there's an open issue on Mesos, which is sort of seeing a bit of traction now about implementing the specification within Mesos natively. Um, and that will probably, since Mesos is written in C++, that will probably take advantage of, of, of that uh, library that I just mentioned. The next uh, big implementation that came out a couple of weeks ago, which was really exciting to see, was a full implementation of the executor part of the spec, so for actually running applications um, on a completely different operating system to what we'd originally imagined. So when we developed the spec, um, we, you know, we have fields to specify sort of operating system and architecture. Initially, we just limited those to Linux 64-bit uh, because uh, that's what we develop on at CoreOS. Um, we anticipated that maybe eventually in time we would sort of expand those, but you know, for now we really need to focus to get a working version out the door. But almost immediately, uh, M. Pastanaki started uh, submitting sort of issues and pull requests saying, you know, this is too strict. I'm working on a FreeBSD version, and we need to open. We need to relax things a bit. Um, so he provided a lot of really valuable input and really kept us on our toes to make sure that everything in the spec is not specific to Linux. It's more generic than that. Um, and then in a few weeks, he whipped up this uh, an executor based on sort of FreeBSD using sort of jails for the actual containment um, and using ZFS to provide a lot of uh, to provide the management of the different sort of layers of, of containers. Um, another project that came out is called Acido, or Acido, I suppose. Um, and that's like this sort of bit of a, a nuts and bolts toolkit of, of doing things for working with application containers and working with Rocket specifically um, and to test application containers. And then this tool that's come out in the last, again, quite recently, is called Docker to ACI. Um, it was originally developed uh, outside of just by someone, someone outside of the, the organization, but since has been moved into the AppC organization. And this does pretty much what it sounds like. Um, the idea is you will give it a, a reference a Docker image. It will go out and pull down that Docker image and any dependent images, and then convert it to an ACI that's compliant with the AppC spec, which you should then be able to run in an AppC executor. Um, and it also works with sort of custom repository, uh, custom Docker repositories. At the moment, sorry, at the moment it's just a command line tool, but it's uh, currently there's some pull requests open to split it out into a library so that other things can take advantage of this. So for example, one of our plans is for uh, Rocket, which we'll get to soon, um, to take advantage of this library so that Rocket can run Docker images basically effectively natively. It will sort of do this translation in line, but it will be able to pull from Docker repositories, uh, pull down the, the image that you already, you know, you already have, uh, and run it as a Rocket image. So just to sort of 
cap off like where the, what the status is of, of the AppC spec. Um, it's stabilizing. It's by no means finished. Um, it's a very young project. Um, we sort of the current numeric, you know, in terms of numbers, we're at sort of v0.2 at the moment. Um, by the time we hit sort of 0 0.5 or 1.0, we're going to say like we're going to sort of draw, draw a line in the stand and say we're happy with this. It's stable. We want everyone to go out and build against it. But as you can see, people are already building against it, um, so which is great to see. Um, there's sort of a few main areas that we want to flesh out and sort of finalize before it's stable. Um, and those are around uh, things like pods. Um, so if you're not familiar with pods, it's sort of a term that uh, Kubernetes introduced and popularized. And the idea there is that the fundamental unit of deployment is not just a single process, but it might be multiple applications running in a single container. So you might have your database, and alongside it, you might have uh, a database backup tool. And you actually want them to be running in the same uh, network sort of ne namespace in the Linux world, um, the same mount namespace, the same PID namespace. Um, and that sort of thing is a little tricky to accomplish with some of the existing containing tools. Uh, and so we want that to be a first class, first class part of the app specification. Then there's a bit of work to do about isolators. And there, that's just sort of coming to agreeing on what the right primitives are to define for things like memory limits and CPU limits and network limits. We've had a lot of really valuable input from Google on that, but since this is something they've been working on for many, many, many years. Um, and finally, best practices. Um, we, we do get a, a few questions which are like, you, you know, oh, um, tar is not a very efficient format. Like, why, why are you developing a, uh, a modern specification and using... Um, using an old format like tar. Um, and actually, as I said earlier, with, with sort of this eye to optimization, we put a lot of thought into a lot of this stuff to leave it open to, to, to optimize in all of these areas. Uh, so for example, to be able to really cache uh, things aggressively. So potentially, rather than like storing an entire tar on disk, you might store the expanded tar um, and reference the files only as necessary, and that kind of thing. So we want to write up a guide to sort of explain Look, the spec is simple intentionally, but here's what we expect that, op that implementations would take advantage of to, to have a really efficient uh, system. Uh, so that was the spec, and now I'm going to talk a bit more about Rocket, um, unless anyone wants to ask any questions about the spec itself. Nope. Great. Do you need a break? Am I going OK? <laughs> Great. All right, so let's talk about Rocket. What is Rocket? Well, Rocket is the first implementation of AppC. Um, again, sort of released in tandem. Um, specifically, what Rocket implements is the discovery part of the spec, the image discovery part, um, the executor component, so running applications, and the metadata service. Uh, sorry, would you mind going back one? Um, so Rocket actually takes advantage of a lot of the libraries, excuse me, uh, a lot of the libraries in the spec uh, repository. So, excuse me. A lot of the libraries that AC tool uses, for example, um, so that it's sort of it's very closely aligned with the spec as the spec develops. Uh, next, Rocket is uh, a tool written in in Go because we're big fans of Go at CoreOS, as you might have noticed, um, and it runs on Linux. But to be specific, it runs on any modern Linux. It's not uh, it's not necessarily targeted at CoreOS. Um, the idea is that it's completely self-contained, so it will run on any distribution that has a modern kernel. Uh, so we have developers. I, I develop on Fedora. We have developers on Ubuntu um, and Debian as well, I think. Um, and we, we, you know, we test it on, cent on CoreOS, of course, but it's not our... Uh, the idea is that it, it's, it's just generally targeted at Linux and the Linux kernel. Um, also, it's an init system agnostic. So as Brian was saying earlier, we're sorry, Redbeard was saying earlier, we're big fans of System D at uh, CoreOS, and that's what we use in CoreOS, and that's what Fedora uses, um, but Rocket itself is not coupled to System D in any way, so it will, will run fine on a, on a Ubuntu system. Rocket is uh, command line only. This is a really important uh, part of the design, and something that distinguishes it from some other container tools that are out there. There's no daemon. There's no long-running Rocket service sort of with an API to talk to. Um, everything is done through invocations of the Rocket CLI. And the, the implication here, or the, the sort of important uh, part of this, is that anything you run under Rocket, any application image, any container you run, uh, is sort of spawned directly under Rocket itself. 
and I'll illustrate this. So for example, if you're just on a command line and you run a rocket command, the application is run directly underneath rocket uh, as a child process. If you were using an init system like Runit, I don't actually know who uses Runit these days, or systemd, uh, or upstart, rocket runs directly underneath it. And so if we go back to systemd, for example, so for example, if you're applying things like memory limits or CPU limits through systemd, because systemd has quite robust primitives for con constraining applications, uh, those will apply to Rocket and in turn will apply directly to your application. Um, and so Systemd will be able to track the running of your application uh, sort of as a first class citizen. Where's the metadata server? Uh, that's a good question. There's, uh, the question was where was the metadata server? Is it stored under Rocket? Um, the metadata server will, in most environments, we would expect that it will run as a, as a, a separate service, so as a daemon on the system. Um, or it could even run as a daemon on another host somewhere. It, that's down to the implementation. With the implementation of Rocket specifically, it will run uh, as a de well, there's actually two modes at the moment. The first is that it will run within Rocket. Um, the other is that it will run as a separate daemon. And when Rocket starts up, it will register with the daemon and, and sort of set up the appropriate networking, uh, networking connections so that the application can still talk to that, that address that gets passed to it and talk to the metadata service. Oops. Come on. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the, the architecture of Rocket, what it looks like, uh, or how it's structured, I should say. Um, and in Rocket, we, we have the modular, relatively modular architecture. We divide execution into stages. Um, and the idea there is that we want these stages to be pluggable so that uh, Rocket is, is actually quite flexible in how it works. So stage zero of an execution, or of any Rocket command, is the actual Rocket binary itself. And so uh, that's responsible for, for example, for, for fetching application images, for doing the discovery, um, pulling them down to disk. When you run an application, it's responsible for setting up the container file system, so like unpacking the image or creating you know, overlayFS, for example. So we don't actually expect that stage zero would necessarily be swapped out when I say it's modular. The key thing that we expect would change is stage one. Stage one is the execution environment for the apps. Now, as I mentioned, we want the first class primitive of, uh, of the app container spec to be sort of multiple applications, potentially multiple applications running together in a single environment. Um, as a result of that, you, know, you need something to, to, to manage multiple applications. Uh, and so what st the definition of stage one is that it's a, a small root file system for uh, sort of this, this master process, this init uh, of the stage one. Uh, so in the case of our current implementation that's bundled, that's bundled into Rocket at the moment, that's uh, systemd. So it'll actually spawn up systemd uh, inside a container. Um, and then systemd itself, the, the new systemd instance in there is responsible for starting off the actual applications. Um, the nice thing about that is it allows us to have things like uh, restart policies, for example, or we have sort of event hooks like a pre-start hook or a, a post-stop hook after an application ends. Um, that are all managed within Rocket, within, the, uh, within that instance. Uh, excuse, sorry. And then the unit binary in stage one is also responsible for things like setting up the containment, um, as I mentioned, setting up the metadata service, whether that actually means running a metadata service or just sort of connecting, connecting back to a central metadata daemon. So I mentioned we use systemd, um, but we've already had, for example, uh, a couple of really interesting different implementations using um, things like uh, KVM, so actually QMU and KVM. So actually spinning up a, v a VM uh, in the stage one environment to run the apps within that. Stage two is essentially just the applications getting executed within the environment. So this is after the, you know, all the constraints have been set up, after the, the necessary, I don't know, the, vol the file system has been set up, all the volumes have been set up. That's really just where your application actually runs. So, I'll talk a bit about what's happening with Rocket. Um, when we announced it at the beginning of December, it was week V0.1.0, um, and it was pretty limited. There wasn't a whole lot it could do. Um, Rocket, it was very, it's very much a prototype, very much evolving very quickly. So at the time that it launched, uh, there were two things it could do. The first was fetch images. Um, and there's a few different ways it can do this. It can uh, fetch an image directly by a URL. So, you know, this is just pulling down a binary from the URL you give it. It's not too interesting. 
The next is uh, discovering an image. And so this is where we start to, this is where we go back to the image discovery process that we talked about earlier. And so that's the idea of going, saying, hey, this is my image name, uh, you know, coreos.com slash etcd. Um, this is a, a, a version, like a tag, and so, or a label in the spec. Um, that's what I'm interested in getting. Go find that for me. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how that works in a minute. Um, and then when Rocket would actually retrieve, artifact, retrieve ACIs, it just stores them in a simple sort of content addressable store on disk where they're stored using that image ID, we, the hash we talked about earlier. Um, the next command that worked was Rocket Run. Um, again, that would, that would simply just run the app. And there's, there's a few different ways of referencing an app. There's actually a fourth, which is the, the one from before, where you can reference a URL directly. And so a run, if the image is not already available, uh, it will, Rocket will transitively try to, to fetch the image. Um, the, one of the things I want to point out here is that once we have the image available locally, uh, we can run it directly based on its hash, so specifying the, the, the exact image that we want to run. Um, and you can imagine in some environments, in a, maybe in a corporate environment, like behind a firewall, where they, they do just have a centralized repository, a centralized uh, content addressable repository, which is, you know, you can easily spin up sort of proxies and, and cache that and serve it very, very quickly. You can imagine that, and you, you always want to run a very specific version of an app. You can imagine that they might always just reference apps directly by, by a hash. So I'll talk about what's happened in Rocket since then. Uh, we're currently at sort of, we had a V2.0 release a couple of weeks ago and quite a few new, new things. Um, the first thing is we have a whole bunch of new commands. So Rocket Enter, Rocket List, Rocket Status, Rocket GC, Rocket Trust. Uh, Rocket Enter and List, pretty straightforward, do what you might expect. Rocket Enter allows you to sort of interact with a running application. So you, you enter the environment in which the application is running, and you can sort of poke around the file system or the processes or the network namespace. Rocket List, just simple list of all the containers running on the system. And then two commands I want to talk about in a bit more detail, Rocket Status and Rocket GC. So Rocket Status is about uh, you know, introspecting the current status of a container. Is it running? Uh, are the applications running? That's the kind of thing. Um, Rocket GC is about collecting old, you know, cleaning up old containers. And one of the things that's, that's sort of imp really important here is that since we don't have a daemon, since we're, Rocket is always just invoked as, as a command line, we need to, um, you know, from the beginning, we need to deal with a case of, of running these commands, running multiple Rocket commands simultaneously and sort of how that interacts. Um, the way we do that is we use file-based locking. So, for example, when a container starts up, Rocket will take a lock uh, on the directory containing that, uh, containing that container. Then when another command comes along, like Rocket Status or Rocket GC, uh, they will try to take a lock on the container. Um, if it works, then great. They can, so for example, if GC can take a lock, then it knows it can garbage collect that container. But if it can't take the, an exclusive lock, then it knows that the container is still in use. Um, similarly with Status, that's how we can detect whether a container is still running or not. Um, so that provides a very safe sort of atomic way that's like guaranteed by the kernel. Um, so we don't have to sort of use you know, heuristics or guess about p use PID files or anything like that. This is very, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much guaranteed by, by the syscalls. Um, Rocket GC, it's a very simple sort of uh, mark and sweep GC. So by that I mean, uh, you know, we iterate over all the containers. The ones that aren't in use, we, mark, we move them to a trash, which again is an atomic operation uh, on Linux. Um, and then the next time Rocket GC comes along, uh, it will sort of check using the timestamps on those, on those files in the trash. It will decide whether or not it needs to delete them. And the idea there is that Rocket GC is something you would run uh, from a cron job or a, time, a systemd timer unit or something like that. You would just have it run periodically. So again, um, just to sort of stress that there's no like long running daemon that needs to keep track of these things. We try and push all that logic keep things as simple as possible in Rocket and push that logic to, to sort of other orchestrators to take, take that responsibility. So, for example, a, a cron job. Um, and then uh, the other command I want to talk about is Rocket Trust. Um, so that is, a, Rocket Trust is a command to, to manage uh, signing keys. So as I mentioned, it's very important to us, uh, security is very important to us, and particularly uh, signing images, for example. We want to really make sure that that's the default behavior everywhere, and that's what everyone's used to. Rocket Trust is a command we use to, to sort of make that, try and make that easier. 
Um, and the idea there is that you can, going back to the, 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 the sort of DNS namespace, that you can trust a, uh, trust a certain key. Like in the second example, we can trust the key that's located at that URL, and we can trust it against uh, when we're discovering applications or at, when we're discovering images, we can trust it for images that have this prefix, what this name. And I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you how that actually works in a second. Uh, the other big change that happened very recently was that uh, previously we used to bundle that stage one that Rocket uses, which is currently that systemd and that rootfs, uh, into Rocket itself um, using a slightly hacky thing called go bin data, which encodes a binary as go code. Um, that was great for making a very convenient uh, version of Rocket that everyone could just pull down a simple binary um, and run it anywhere, and it just worked. Um, but it's not very feasible when it comes to like packaging Rocket for uh, distribution. So, for example, uh, Red Hat is is pack currently they're looking at packaging Rocket for Fedora 21, um, and for them it's sort of a non-starter to have this big like binary blob and put that in. They need to be able to build it from sources. Um, but so what we've done is split out that stage one that Rocket uses by default into just another application containing image. So the same, same format that, that your actually application would be in. And then that's what Rocket uses as the stage one. Um, and the really cool part about that is that then it opens up these, these worlds for these swappable, swappable, swappable execution environments within Rocket. Uh, so potentially you could run uh, kind of VM containers and uh, or containers using our default uh, stage one alongside each other and still interact, still be able to sort of have the same expectations and interactions with them. So, oh, it's not working. <laughs> oh, there it is. I wanted to give you a quick crash course in Rocket. Does everyone recognize this? Okay. For those of you who don't, this is uh, the SpaceX rocket that the Falcon 9, uh, they were trying to capture, like, they're all about reusable rockets, and they wanted to capture it after it, because normally people just throw rockets away, they blow up. They wanted to actually capture it and reuse it, but it uh, didn't quite go right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so that was, that was the signal for me to do a, a quick yes. demo. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, why did you not implement the REST API? Why did we not, the question was, why did we not implement a REST API? Uh, well, I mean, there's a couple of couple of things to go into there. I mean, my first immediate response would be, what's the need for a REST API? Um, okay, so Rocket, you know, a really it's really important to us that Rocket is this small composable component usable with other systems. Once you get to the point of sort of exposing an API for orchestrations, then it's very difficult to use it with systems like Kubernetes or Mesos or Fleet or other things like that because we think that those layers are doing the orchestration, and we think they should be responsible for that. That's what they're focused on, that's what they're spending all of their time thinking about and working on. And once you have uh, sort of multiple orchestration systems, then things become very strange. So we want it to be a very simple, simple thing um, that would work if you would just run it on your systemd system, you could use all the systemd primitives to control it, or you could connect it with Mesos and use all the Mesos very advanced scheduling things to control it, and it would just work. You don't need to worry about sort of this discordance between uh, primitives they expose and things like that. <coughs> Is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the uh, maybe the slightly nicer would answer would be we certainly wouldn't object to there being a Rocket API that someone would create, but we would not. It would it would never become part of uh, Rocket itself. No. Yeah. All right. So. With a little luck, I'm going to show you a couple of things in Rocket uh, quickly. So I mostly want to show you the, um, the uh, image, image, sort of, uh, image discovery and the signing stuff that I talked about. So here I am. I'm running on just a Fedora system, which is just an Enspawn container on my I can type on my host. Can everyone see? This is a bit small. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so this is the Rocket uh, CLI. So as I mentioned, sort of the commands we talked about. So if I was to do a list, I would see those, there are no containers. So the first thing I want to do is try to um, uh, fetch... Uh, we're going to use etcd.com... Uh, sorry, etcd. Are, are you all familiar with etcd, what etcd is? Yeah? 
Okay, so just a, oh, actually, uh, of course, Redbeard educated you all about it, so hopefully <laughs> you're paying attention. So to come back to that example from earlier, the first thing I'm going to do is to, is to tell Rocket that I want to try and fetch the, uh, the image of etcd at uh, version 2.2.0. So if the internet's working, come on. I... Doo -doo -doo. All right. So we see that it was searching for this image, and then it's found this URL, and now it's downloading it. So what actually happened there? That's what I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so the first thing that it did is it took this URL, this took this name that I gave it, coros.com slash etcd, and it appended uh, HTTPS to the start, and it, it tried to access this URL. Um, this happens to be a 404, so the next thing it will do is it will try and walk up the tree, and this is the idea of using the, the hierarchical namespace, and it will go to coros.com. That is fortunately not a 404. Um, so then it will, ex it will inspect the HTML that's on that page, that it, the first page that it successfully reaches, and it will look for these things called meta tags, um, which are just some simple annotations in the HTML. Oops. And it finds these two meta tags called AC discovery and AC discovery pub keys. So this first meta tag, um, whose, whose name is coros.com etcd, so that corresponds to the, the name of the application we were trying to retrieve, um, that provides Rocket with this template uh, which it can use to then try and retrieve that image. So in this case, um, we provided the version, so it substituted the version. Um, since Rocket is uh, you know, Linux 64, it substituted those automatically. And then the extension, the first thing that it looked for was ACI, because that's the extension of an, of an application container image. If another implementation, for example, the FreeBSD one, was trying to run the same image, uh, it would substitute a different OS architecture there, and it would try to retrieve that URL instead. So that's how we got to this URL here. So Rocket downloaded that. That was fine. The next thing it tried to do, using that same template, was download the signature, because again, we want to encourage sort of signature validation by default. It retrieved that signature from this file, but then we got an error. And the reason we got that error is because Rocket doesn't know how to trust anything yet, so it doesn't, it doesn't want to use that image. So uh, now we come to the Rocket, tr Rocket trust command. So if I tell, tell Rocket I want to trust uh, coros.com slash etcd. What it's going to do is walk through that same process I mentioned of going to coros.com slash etcd and then walking back up the tree because it was a 404. And it looks for this specific uh, tag here, AC Discovery Pub Keys. And it finds, again, that's the name for which it's searching. And it finds this URL where it can retrieve uh, a GPG public key. It pulls down. It pulls down the key, and then it asks me if I want to trust it. This is the kind of thing where, yes, sorry, go ahead. I, I just wonder, uh, you must maintain very good uh, relationship to your marketing department. How so? <laughs> because uh, if I uh, propose something like that, I need to go to our marketing department and ask them to put special uh, metadata headers into their uh, <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I have two answers for you. One of them is an existing issue discussing one of these, uh, <laughs> the standard for, I don't know if you know of the well-known, I actually hadn't heard of it before, but there is an RFC describing a well-known mechanism. So this is something we're definitely going to consider. For st I'm sorry? Oh. <laughs> and then another one is about oops, using DNS records for discovery as well. Um, and we're pretty, we're, we're definitely going to go ahead with that. We're still, these are all copied from the previous discussion, um, still just uh, figuring out the exact way we should support that, what the right records are. Uh, there's a few sort of different opinions on that, whether we should figure out a new uh, record type, and things like that. So yes, we absolutely plan to support alternative mechanisms. Um, when you're a small company, it's, it's relatively easy to change the site. So. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, I encourage you to chime in on, on those two issues if you sort of have something to, to contribute there. Um, so obviously it's very important to sort of, this is the point at which it's very important to actually verify that you want to trust that key. Um, I'm not even going to bother. So now we see that it's added this key uh, to trust this prefix. So what that means is whenever I discover images that have that specific prefix, uh, Rocket is going to trust that key when it's checking the signatures for images like that. Um, and the way that's laid out in is in this sort of hierarchy again. So we can see that because that key, that's just the, the fingerprint of the key, is under this uh, prefix, that it will be trusted for things under this prefix. But for example, if I had trusted it for coreos.com, then it would trust that key for any images prefix with coreos.com. Yes? Uh, could that be um, distributed, like in etcd? Uh, so could... no, image... The question was, can this be distributed like etcd? That's a great question. It absolutely could be distributed like etcd. Um, but the other answer to that is that uh, we, we currently have it defined with sort of a simple overlay uh, mechanism so that the first place it will look is uh, in user rocket trusted keys, I think. And so we expect that operating systems, so for example, like CoreOS, would actually ship, uh, that, that follows the same structure as the etcd, as the etcd tree, as the, as the etsy tree. The operating systems might ship with a list of trusted keys, just as, um, for example, on Red Hat, it might ship with the uh, trusted GPG key for Red Hat RPMs. Um, and then we provide a simple means of sort of blacklisting those keys uh, if, you, if you want to you know, prevent them. OK, so now if we do the fetch once again. And you notice that it's going to fetch it from scratch again. That's because we didn't save it because uh, we didn't trust it. Um, you can imagine that there would be a sort of, uh, I don't know, a dumb cache that would Trust, maybe trust, maybe uh, store some things for untrusted things for a period of time, but we're not doing that at this stage. Okay, so now it's retrieved, retrieved the image. Um, it's, it's verified the signature that's trusted by the uh, by the by the uh, uh, public key that we just trusted, and it's given us this hash. And this hash is the uh, image ID that we've the, you know that I've been talking about a few times. So that's the canonical representation of that image. Um, if I wanted to actually see what that looks like. I could see here that Rocket stored it in its CAS on disk, its content addressable store on disk, and it's simply storing the name uh, by the, storing the uh, image by the hash. Um, again, coming back to the idea that we're sort of building around these very sort of standard, well-known tools, I could have a look at this, uh, oops, have a look at this image, and I see that it's just the tar file that contains uh, etcd, some documentation, and the actual etcd thing itself. So now if I was to do uh, rocket run and do exactly the same process, what this is going to do is, is it's still going to look out for the discovery, go to the site and, and retrieve, figure out the URL from which it should retrieve it. But once it's figured out the URL, um, it recognizes that it already has that cached. Um, and this sort of, since that's caching URLs, we use things like uh, e tags to make sure that you know, the content hasn't changed. Um, and then it's, uh, it's running. Now, this is what running a, an etcd app looks like. Uh, let's see. So now, if we were to go over to another session, we can see the container's running. Um, let's see, what else? We could GC, but that would not do anything. Um, once we kill the container, whoops, uh, we see that it'll sort of mark it for garbage. And then uh, if I just tell it to garbage collect everything immediately, it will collect the container, and it's all gone. Does anyone have any questions while I'm playing with Rocket? or want to applaud or anything? No? <laughs> all right, let's get back to this. Oops. Oops. Okay. So that was that's Rocket where we are today. Um, well, actually, that's a little bit behind where we are today. Today, because things are moving so fast. Um, but I want to talk about what's coming. Some of the things on the near in the near horizon. Uh, the first is networking. We've been doing a lot of work on networking, but we haven't um, haven't announced anything with networking yet because it's such a 
tricky area. We kind of want to make sure we get it right. Um, there's a big uh, document, a proposal about networking on Google Docs where we've been getting a ton of feedback from people on sort of what it should look like. Um, and I say it's complicated because, as I mentioned earlier, everyone has a different idea of what networking is. Everyone has different requirements. Um, I used to work at, at Twitter before CoreOS, and they had the most ridiculously sort of esoteric requirements for networking that made it like absolutely impossible to give an IP address to a container, for example. And, and you end up working with all these complicated. Yep. Are you sitting on my phone? Uh, yeah, probably. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so what we're going with networking in Rocket is to use a, a plugin-based system so that um, Rocket can call out to uh, different you know, tools that you can create uh, to specify like, what it means to assign, allocate an IP in your environment. So maybe that talks to your conflict management system, maybe it talks to your, I don't know, your router or, or any, that kind of thing. Um, there's a few different plugins already. Uh, if you want all the details, there's a, there's a big Google Doc up, up describing all that. The other thing on the horizon for Rocket, which we're really excited about, is integration with Kubernetes. Um, as you might know, Kubernetes, as of today, uh, only works with Docker images. But the guys over there are, are really excited about seeing um, alternatives, uh, support for alternative container uh, formats and runtimes. So there's an open issue kind of tracking that work. The Google guys themselves are so busy, sort of heads down, on getting Kubernetes 1.0 out the door um, that they're not working on it. But we're seeing people from the community that are stepping up um, which is, is really great. And if you're interested in that, I encourage you to check out that issue. Uh, so that's it. Um, again, these are both community projects, completely open source. Um, we do try to do everything through GitHub. So we discuss things through issues or through pull requests. Um, occasionally, we use Google Docs because they're, we find the commenting system is a little better. But those, again, we publicize through GitHub. We also have mailing lists for both projects. Um, and we have a, quite a lot of issues under, with a help wanted label on GitHub if you're looking for something to sort of get started hacking on. And that's all I have. So do you have any other questions unrelated to the phone in my pocket? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yes? What was the reason for you for creating Rocket from scratch rather than trying to helping Docker resolving the issues? The question was, what was the reason for creating Rocket from scratch rather than helping Docker with the issues? Um, that's a, a quite a loaded question. <laughs> um, I will say that the one important that's very important to us, the one point that's very important to us is that it's composable and operates with init systems. Um, and what that would probably look like in the Docker world is a command like uh, st uh, something called standalone mode, where instead of talking to a Docker daemon, the Docker can directly execute images. That's been a request that that's been a feature that's been requested in Docker for about two years. Um, we've been very adamant about that. Um, a lot of other people have been very adamant about that, but unfortunately, that hasn't been something that they've wanted to support. Um, despite those, the issues related to that on GitHub have been sort of closed without any real uh, resolution. So uh, unfortunately, that was sort of a that was causing us. It didn't seem like they were going to change, uh, uh, seem like they are interested in changing that model. And for us, that sort of has fundamental issues with how it interacts with systemd, for example. Um, another side to it is that um, uh, we really wanted this specification to be um, uh, well-defined and to be sort of open so that other implementations could work. So it didn't necessarily need to be the Docker daemon that run Docker images. Because at the end of the day, like I said, it's just a tarball and some, some metadata. So it should be portable and should be able to run on systems that don't necessarily have Docker. Um, but unfortunately, again, that wasn't something that uh, they seemed to be too interested in. Um, since we announced Rocket and uh, app, the AppC spec, they have since created a, a document describing the specification, which is good to see. Um, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't meet some of our requirements in the areas of security, for example. Yes? Um, one great thing about Docker is the, the Docker client. Uh, how do you create ACI images? <coughs> great question. So the question was, one thing about, uh, fundamental thing about Docker is the Docker file um, used to create Docker images. How do you create ACI images? Um, so at the moment, uh, we have some, some very simple tooling, like AC tool that I mentioned, which will simply expect a, a root file system, um, and then it'll create that into an ACI. Um, obviously, the nice part about Docker files is it allows you to 
sort of somewhat programmatically create a root file system from maybe from nothing. Um, one of the things that we, we, we aren't so, such big fans of is the pattern, or we, we sort of think of it as an anti-pattern that's very common in the Docker world of, for example, basing your images on Ubuntu and then doing an app get update and then figuring out your app. Because that drags in a lot of uh, dependencies and libraries that, you know, at the end of the day, you might not really need. Um, and it makes it very difficult to sort of track what's running in containers and be able to update them in the, in the case of, of vulnerabilities, which is obviously a, a, a key part of CoreOS. Um, so, for example, uh, last week with the last week or the week before with the ghost vulnerability, um, we had customers, we had users coming to us uh, and saying, you know, help, like, what's happening with ghost? How are we going to be updated? Are we safe? And we would say, yes, we've patched CoreOS. The updates rolled out. As long as you, your updates applied, you're fine. Then they would come back and say, well, I'm running all these Docker containers. They're based on Ubuntu. Like, help. Like, what do I do? And so, you know, unfortunately, there's not a great answer for that because, you know, we don't maintain Ubuntu. They need to rebuild their container. Who knows what else is in the container that might be vulnerable? So we want to go in a different direction with the, gen with how we, we, the vision of how we see containers being built, which is much more minimal minimalistic. So, for example, we want to tie them in with uh, uh, the native, like, build tools for your, for your application. So um, I wrote a very... Um, just to give you a very quick example... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just to give you a very simple example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. <laughs> is it an iPhone 6? Is that why it's yes, going to bend? Oh. bend? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to give you a very simple example of what I'm talking about, um, I, I wrote something on the train called uh, Go ACI, which will take a Go project. Um, you know, which is just the source code running, you know, sitting on disk. Well, actually, in this case, it sort of tries to mimic the Go command, which will pull down the repository. Um, it then builds that as a static, um, excuse me, as a static, uh, static binary, um, builds that into an ACI, and then that actually gives you, in one command, a, an image that you can run again in Rocket, for example. Um, so in Go, that's pretty easy, but we really want this to be this kind of thing to emerge with um, sort of other environments like Python apps, JVM apps, things like that. Uh, so, you, for, so for Python, for example, you can imagine like a setup.py with a target of ACI that would actually build your Python app and then build that into an ACI itself. So that's the kind of direction uh, we want to go in for how to build ACIs. Um, but again, we expect to sort of see, I don't know, different tooling emerge around that as well. Um, another example might be with Puppet. We would expect, we're, we're actually talking pretty actively to a lot of the config management vendors. And you might, you could see something like, um, uh, a puppet command where you would apply a manifest to a uh, to a certain directory, and it would sort of run that manifest against the directory, and then spit out an ACI that's that's a result of the difference between those directories, or something like that. How does that sound? <laughs> if you ha if you have ideas or, or like for a nice sort of ideal workflow, then I mean, yeah, that sounds much more much more difficult than uh, writing a log file and creating it, which then uh, creating a did you say it sounds more difficult? Kind of, uh, change route and uh, compile this to the ACI. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> the talk that I want to be doing coming up next is showing you how actually simple the construction of a container can be. And, you know, that's one where we'll, uh, we'll get to that one in a few. Okay, okay so. great. And that's, you know, kind of a added bonus for anybody else who wants to stick around. Because I just realized it is 10 p.m. But Oh, really? <laughs> um, yes? Have you been running Rocket within a Jenkins process? The question was, have we been running Rocket within a Jenkins process successfully? Um, he can answer that one. I've kicked the tires on it. It, it works. I mean, I'm actually looking at doing that with all of the stuff that I'm building out for some of the stuff that you're about to see. All the stuff that you're about to see, like the way that I actually build containers, uh, like I started doing it back because I wanted to have my own containers where I knew the real source of it. Again, back to my talk, paranoia, all kinds of paranoia. Uh, but I also wanted to have some mechanism that would, uh, in the long term, build reproducible builds um, that you would be able to distribute throughout an organization and guarantee that everything worked consistent. So, uh, with that, I will say, you know, back, back to Yes, it, it, it works okay. Yes? I have a crazy question. Can you build um, rocket containers with 
Can, the question was, can you build rocket containers within the rocket executor? So I'm not, use drones, okay. And, uh, it contains that in, within the docker container execution environment, I can't build a docking container without some hacks. So okay. I can say, great, I can use rockets because I can run drones in the container and I can build rocket images. And then they might say, oh, we now drone run uh, rockets. And then okay. I can build my, rock, build my rocket container. Okay. Uh, that's a great question. I have not tried. As of today, uh, excuse me, uh, it won't work because we haven't exposed, we haven't quite uh, uh, confirmed the semantics around like exposing things like proc into, into the, into the, within the container yet. Because so it's, it's a little difficult to do that in an, in an OS agnostic way. So we might do that sort of as an extension to the spec. Um, so not today, but yes, it'll it'll definitely be possible. Yes. Uh, the question was, is there any chance of a rocket implementation running on Windows? That's an interesting question I haven't really thought about. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just uh, asked because Microsoft is very interested in Docker. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my, the short answer would be probably not rocket itself, but an implementation of the ABC spec, yeah, absolutely. That's what I mean. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. In that case, definitely. I, we're trying to, anything that's in the spec that is... Uh, not possible on Windows today. I suspect we would we would definitely be open to changing to make sure that it is, you know, expressed in such a way that it's possible on Windows. Yes. Uh, what led to the decision to implement Rocket in Go and C or C plus plus or Rust? Good question. Uh, the question was what led to the decision to implement Rocket in Go and not C or C plus um, plus. At CoreOS, we do almost everything in Go. We're big Go fans, um, and we find that it works really well, allows us to implement things very quickly. Um, and a lot of the kind of things that we needed, there are already sort of solid libraries for. Um, and particularly as we expand Rocket to deal with more sort of container-related things, um, we're planning on using the existing libcontainer library, which is quite robust and very actively developed to do a lot of this stuff. Um, we just find that, you know, when de dealing with things like HTTP and... and um, sort of encryption and uh, uh, what else, hashing and things like that, it would just be, it would be dramatic, significantly greater engineering effort to do it in C, C++. Have Next you question. looked at Rust before, or do you plan to do it once it's out officially in 1.0? Um, I can't speak for CoreOS as a company. <laughs> I can just say, personally, it's a very interesting language to me, but it's been, so far it's been, Far too unstable to consider for anything sort of related to you know production yeah. use. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is it possible uh, to integrate uh, the Redis instance uh, Docker image inside the uh, rocket in different ways? And uh, yeah. how can we do? Sorry, did you say already running or already? No, 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 no. already provided. Uh -huh. Yep, that's why that the uh, Docker to ACI tool should should do that for you. So um, at the moment, I think it actually only works with pulling images down from Docker Hub, but we also would expect it to work with an image you have on disk that you might not be in the hub. But that's absolutely what it's intended for. Yes. The question was, how do we keep it secure with regards to code reviews? Um, that's an interesting question. Would you, could you be a little more specific in terms of... Uh, so that you, got, you said that you have a lot of contributors. I mean, I'm not, maybe not specific to uh, the rocket itself, mm -hmm. but um, there's so many components coming into what you get packaged into your core OS, it just comes down. Mm. So there's elements of trust there with regards to, okay, yeah, we're using standard tools with regards to, yeah, okay, we can Getting inside of the upstream sources, for example, do you mean? Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess you're asking in terms of like, what, how, to what level of auditing do we do of upstream sources? Uh, could you speak to that, Redbeard? Um, so we actually 
work directly with a number of the communities there, uh, specifically. Uh, so, what was that? <laughs> so, one of the things that we do is um, CoreOS, uh, similar to Chrome OS. So, this is another similarity there. Um, we actually end up using Gentoo eBuilds as an upstream, um, where with the Gentoo eBuilds, we verify the sources. We pull them in from those locations that most of those sources actually have uh, um, uh, uh, like GPG signatures attached to them so that we validate that we're getting the correct content. But at the same time, it's extremely uh, you know, similar to some of the package maintenance processes with other districts where they have some subject matter experts for those packages. And we, since there is so few packages involved, um, we are able to validate that it is the same <laughs> version. And we don't update everything just because a new version comes out. So just because a new version of bin utils comes out, we don't ship it. So that's similar also to where I was talking about, like we pushed some changes to uh, like GCC 2.19 but we found problems in it in our testing process, so we were able to revert that back. And we have a pretty robust testing process for, for doing that. So folks from our systems team actually do a lot of that validation, but we also work with uh, the community at large to be able to keep track of a lot of those patches that we could do. Hmm. Uh, yes? Yeah. Uh, you you want to go ahead? Question, uh, what do you mean by an image layout? Right now, the images are tabbled, right? Yes. So there's no inheritance between images. I see. Uh, so dependencies also? Um, well, it's oh. uh, base images, but then you specify some defects. Mm -hmm. You don't have to download everything if you have some inheritance. Uh, sure. So there's two things I would say to that. The question was, do we support sort of image layout or inheritance? Was that right? There were layers. Layers. Um, so we do have the idea of a dependency, um, which is very similar to the idea of a layer, um, in that that would be a dependent image that gets pulled down and assembled into the, the root FS when we're creating the root FS for that application. Um, and then there's also the concept of the path whitelist. So if you wanted to exclude files from the, any dependent images. Um, one of the ideas we have here is that uh, if you were to, is that we have this sort of dependency match matching mechanism, so that if you were to uh, always want the latest versions of a certificates package, for example, you could omit the ID so that you're not referring to a specific ID. And then when it does discovery to try and resolve that image, it would, it would uh, and you use sort of a, I don't know, like a version equals latest, then it would always retrieve the latest version. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is that a proposal that's come up is to um, actually uh, to have an extension to allow you to mount uh, the parts of the host file system into the container as uh, before the root file system is, is provided, mount it read-only before the root file system is provided, so that then you could actually leverage things from the host file system. Yes? Um, maybe I didn't see it, but uh, uh, I didn't see the, the new finger uh, command. So, for example, it's possible to use the proper uh, containers uh, each other, so they can discover each other So the question was, um, is there a f something similar to Docker linking to be able to, to link containers together? So I mean, I think the, the basic answer there is that if you want applications that like have a hard requirement on each other, being able to talk to, to each other directly, then that actually they actually become part of the coming back to the pods thing I was talking about earlier. They actually become part of the pod. So they're within the same. Um, uh, let's see. Sorry. So a container sort of executes apps that, and, and, and the apps share this, these, these uh, different namespaces, like PID namespace, network namespace, mount namespace, IPC namespace. So they can see each other directly. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, they would, beyond that, it becomes you know, a matter of discovering each other via whatever your sort of service discovery mechanism is, mechanism is. That might be the metadata server. And then they can communicate with those other containers through um, through IPs. The nice thing about the idea of that, that, that sort of Kubernetes was very strongly pushing about allocating an IP per uh, container is that you can actually then run on uh, well-known ports. 
um, because you don't have to worry about colliding with other containers on the system. Um, and that makes service discovery much more predict much simpler, much more predictable. Uh, anyone else? Yes? So, um, have there any new containment features? Or what are the plans in Actu to support this? Because it sounds to me at least uh, similarly complex as Mad version or something. <laughs> yes. Um, so at the moment we have sort of a very, this is an area we haven't really spent a lot of time in yet. Oh, I mean, we have spent a lot of time thinking about it, um, but we haven't, certainly haven't finalized it yet. Um, our thinking there is that we would have a set of like well-known isolators. So for example, here. Um, um, but, uh, and those well-known isolators would expect it to be implemented by most uh, container executives, but at some point it would be executive dependent on whether or not, you know, what they can support and if there are any particular extensions. Um, so that's, that's about where we are. That's a, pr a pretty standard list of, of what we're at at the moment. Um, again, we, we, we've had a lot of, the Google guys have been really helpful with that because they've spent so many years kind of going back and forth over these different, what the right isolation primitives are. Um, and I think actually this latest list is, is mostly one that they've sort of contributed to shaping. Uh, anyone else? Nope. Okay, well, thanks for coming and listening, everyone. <laughs>